So starting with tonight's sponsors, again, a big thank you to all of our sponsors for our classes. Um, first, my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Max and Sigi Laredo for the refuash lema of my mother's father, um, Gabriel Ben Masuda, Bezot Hashem will have a speedy recovery and refuash lema from the ICU from COVID and Bezot Hashem he'll feel better, amen. Next is uh, Richard and Karen Lassery for the refuash lema of Richard's father, Moshe Ben Shmuel, and also for my grandfather, Gabriel Ben Mesuda, may they have a refuah shlema in the merit of the Torah study. Amen. Next is Isaac and Eve Capuano for the refuah shlema of my grandfather. Thank you very much for Gabriel Ben Mesuda. Thank you very much. Next sponsor is Susan Steinfeld in honor of her granddaughter, Zahava Miriam's bat mitzvah. May she have a lot of mazel and Yiddish Anachas, amen, thank you. Last but not least, Ron and Eileen Friedman, in honor of their son David's 30th birthday, which is today. So a big Mazel Tov and a lot of Nachas. It, it's, this is within David's year. He just got married, so he's still a Chatan, Hadomel Melech, and may they have only blessing and good things. Amen ve'amen. We're now going to start with the Zer Shimshon. And the Zer Shimshon this week uh, addresses a, a very important issue. And we're going to provide four answers for the following question. So I'll give you the overall question before we start. I'll repeat it as we go along. But it's a real, real good question. And there are multiple answers. And we're going to share them with us with some practical lessons and advice. So the question is, why is it that the tribe of Levi, all of the descendants of Levi, were not enslaved during the slavery and the bondage when the Jewish people were in Egypt? So where does this question stem from? Where does the Zer Shimshon ask this question from? So take a look at your screen. Okay. We are in Exodus chapter 5, verse 4, right at the top of the page over here. It says as follows, Vayomer alehem melech mitzrayim. So the king of Egypt now tells them, Lama Moshe ve'aharon tafriu et ha'am ima'asav lechu lesivlotechem. Paro tells Moses and Aaron, go, why are you disturbing the nation from working? Go to your own labors. So lechul sivlotechem is a very interesting terminology. And the obvious question is, well, why didn't Paro tell Moses and Aaron when they came their very first time to offer Paro a very easy transition of, hey, let my people go. And Paro obviously said no. Why is it that that... Paro tells them to go to your own labors. Why couldn't he enforce them and enslave them? So Rashi picks up on this. Rashi on this very verse, chapter 5, verse 4, says that by the fact that we see that Paro is telling them to go to their own labor, he told them, go be busy with what you're normally busy with. But he was not able to enslave them because they were from the tribe of Levi, and the tribe of Levi was not subjugated to the slavery of the Jewish people in Egypt. Now, why is this so? Why is this such a big question? Of course, of course, out of the 12 tribes, only one selected not to. But there's another issue. If you take a look at your screen, a while ago, hundreds of years ago, I mean, prior to that time, God tells Abraham... Vayomer Lavram, this is in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. God said to Abraham during the covenant of the halves that they made between the two of them that God made with Abraham, you shall surely know that your seed will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and they will enslave them and oppress them for 400 years. 
the Zashim Shan says it is evident that all of Abraham's descendants were included in this. Why is it that the tribe of Levi has this free pass? So I want to give the first answer based on a Midrash. This is not from the Zer Shimshon, but I think this is a very, uh, it's the most basic answer. And then we're going to get a little deeper into some other answers. But the most basic answer is as follows. How is it that Paro was able to transform a completely free nation into slaves? Now, to not make a long story short, uh, to not to make it a long story, the Midrash tells us that Paro said, we got to come up of a, with a way to outwit the Jewish people. And how are we going to do that? Well, the only way we're going to do that is by turning them into slaves, but gradually. Because if we do it at once, they're going to pick up on what's going on and they wouldn't fall for it. So... Pyro comes by the advice of his advisors. He comes out the first day and he himself is there building a new city. The king himself. When I was telling this to my son last night, we were discussing this week's parasha. He's like, so what? So the king's out there. I tell him, so what? Can you imagine the president, Donald Trump, is around the corner by the local park right over here, and he's fixing the slide with a wrench and a hammer. You're telling me not everyone's going to go run and see him? I guarantee you there's going to be loads and loads of people going to see him. It's just a fact. The leader of a country has a lot of attention his way, and people would flock to see him. So not only is Paro there, he's working, he's doing and then Paro says, oh, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And Paro's working with them. And then he says, anyone who comes to work and help, they're going to get a massive stipend, $1,000 for the day. $1,000 for the day? 5000 for a working week? You, your wife, your kids, that's good money. That's how it was the first day. Second day, Paro was also there, but they lowered the wage third day, fourth day, by the end of the week, their wage went from $1,000 a day, let's say, to $100 a day. But they got a free meal. They were able to eat breakfast, lunch, and supper over there. People were enjoying themselves tremendously. Next week, they cut the money and they only were giving them food. So the Jews look at themselves and say, hey, what, what are we even here for? And the Egyptians went and they brought anyone who used to come to work for pay that are no longer showing up, they forced them out of their homes and they said, you are here, you're able to be here, you were here last week or continuing this week. And that's how they slowly, slowly started taking a free nation and making them into slaves. The tribe of Levi, they never left the Bet Midrash, they never left the study hall, they never left the yeshivas. They didn't fall for the gold for the money, for the prize, they understood there's an everlasting goal and prize, and that was studying Torah and upholding the laws of the Torah. So they didn't go to work. They didn't go for slave labor. That was first at pay and then for free. So since they never left, Paro had no dominion over them, no, no control over them. He had no rule over them because they were regular citizens opposed to slaves. And Moses and Aaron being descendants, obviously, from the tribe of Levi, there was no way that Paro was able to hang on to them and force them to, 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 to have slavery. So that's the first answer. That's a simple answer. Second answer is, again, simple. And then we're going to go into the Zer Shimshon's two more intricate answers. Second is very simple. The reason why the Egyptians did not enslave the tribe of Levi wasn't from their own volition. Rather, this was somewhat of a, of a savior that God put into play that 
whoever was not going to worship the Egel, the golden calf, was not going to suffer in the land of Egypt. Now, of course, only God can have such a calculation because only he knew that in the future, the Jewish people would suffer, would, would, would sin. And in the future, they would save, they, they would be saved from sinning in the golden calf. So only the la- only the tribe of Levi would not have to, would not be uh, held at fault. So that's why they were not oppressed. It's a hard answer, but it's it's another answer that's given. All right, listen to the answer the Zeshim Shon gives. One of the two. One is he says that the exile that was during the time of Egypt, the Egyptian exile for the Jewish people, was there to serve as a merit for anyone who is going to inherit the land of Israel. Now, the Zerashim Shon backs this up based on a Midrash. The Midrash tells us, take a look at this verse. Look at back in the book of Genesis, chapter 36, verse 6. It says, says that Esav took his wives, sons, daughters, all the people's household, cattle, animals, property, everything that he acquired. And he went to another land because of his brother Jacob. Mi Yaakov Achiv. Says the Midrash, the Zer Shimshon quotes. The Midrash tells us that Esav wanted to completely separate himself from his brother Yaakov. He heard of, he knew that there was a decree of exile. And therefore he forfeited his right in the land of Israel in order to save himself from the decree of exile. Based on this, the Zer Shimshon says that the tribe of Levi were never going to inherit the land of Israel. Right? The tribe of Levi doesn't have. They have their work in the Bet HaMikdash, in the temple, and they had no right to work in the land. They were not given any land. So the Midrash is telling us, it's, it's helping us as a Zer Shimshon to understand that only the Jews in Egypt that had to inherit the land of Israel were the ones who were going to be oppressed. They were the ones who had the bondage and the slavery. And the tribe of Levi, since they were not going to inherit any land, they were exempt from any of that bondage and suffering. So before we move on to the fourth answer, and this is the second answer from the Zer Shimshon, I want to share a, a short lesson on this. And that is that hard work and effort pays off. We see that the the pain and the suffering that Paro instilled on the Jewish people is what not only shortened their exile, but also gave them the merit to inherit the land of Israel. Also, it was only when Paro started enforcing extra hard labor on the Jewish people that they started giving birth to six tuplets. And do you know, I mean, here, I'm helping you out. Great question is if, if the Torah tells us that they gave uh, that they gave birth six at a time, where's Moshe's other twin and triplet and quadruplet and six tuplet siblings? We're, we only see that Moshe, Aaron, and, and, and Miriam. We don't see that they had any other children. Answer is, is the tribe of Levi, they did not have six children at a time because they were not being oppressed. They would not have the bondage and the slavery we see a repetitive concept that anytime a person is struggling or or put in a hard place or suffering, that's what for the better, for the worse, brings out the greatest side of them. So we shouldn't look at our lives and all of the hard times in our lives as horrible things that we have to go through. No, on the contrary, we don't look for hardship. We don't look for suffering. But when we come, when it comes our way, it stresses us. It tightens us to a point which brings out our best or which we hope for it to bring out our best in order to overcome whatever struggle we are facing at that time. So now I want to move on to the fourth answer that Zer Shimshon gives. And I, I think this is the cherry on the top. Again, the first two answers were quite simple. One, that the Levites, the Levites never became 
slaves because they never left the study hall. The second is because the Levites in the future were not going to serve the Egel Hazahav, the golden calf. So they were not um, privy to this servitude. The third answer we just gave is that only those that are going to merit the land of Israel are going to have to suffer and the Levites are not meriting, are not, are not getting the land of Israel. This answer is something I think absolutely fascinating. The Zer Shimshon quotes the Midrash. This Midrash is a scary Midrash. Many of our commentaries quote this Midrash. The Midrash says that when Joseph passed away, he told, he, the Jewish people, he didn't say, sorry. When Joseph passed away, the Jewish people stopped observing, I think, one of the most important obligations we have. I actually had the merit of, of performing one today, and that is of circumcision. The Jewish people stopped performing circumcision on their boys when Joseph passed away. And they said even worse. They said, we want to be like the Egyptians. So they stopped circumcising because the Egyptians didn't circumcise. They said, we don't want to be hated by the, by the Egyptians. We want to be like the Egyptians. We want to be included in everything like the Egyptians. So they stopped circumcising their boys. Says the Zerashim Shan, it seems like the Jewish people would have not been enslaved if they wouldn't have stopped circumcising their sons. Meaning if they would have continued to circumcise their sons, then this whole thing of the enslavement and the bondage would have never fell upon the Jewish people. They would have been in exile, but who says it would have been so tough and hard? How does he know this? Because we quoted earlier that all of the Jewish people were to be subjugated by this exile, all of the descendants of Abraham. I see here in the chat a good question. Didn't Joseph have the Egyptian circumcised? Yes, he did. But that was only for the very first generation when he came in. After that, their children didn't continue doing that. Joseph attempted to prepare Egypt for his family. He was somewhat successful by having the first generation of Egyptians circumcised, but it didn't continue after that. So the question is, how is it that the Jews now went so far to separate themselves from this decree? But the decree was already there. It was the decree that they'd go into exile. So listen to what the Zer Shimshon suggests as a two-part decree to Avraham's decree that his descendants would be put into exile for 400 years. Part one is that they'd be exiled in foreign land. And if they don't keep the Brit Milah, which by the way was the covenant that Abraham and God made at that time when the decree was made, they would fall into slavery and torture. So it's a two-part decree. For sure exile in a foreign land. Ah, slavery and torture, that's only if the circumcision is not continued to be upheld. Says the Zerashim Shon Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, they were the only ones who kept Brit Milah. They never were enslaved because that was never the intention of this exile. The intention of this exile was just to be out of the land of Israel. Ah, if you don't circumcise, then you're going to have torture and slavery. They continued circumcising, so therefore they were never part of that torture and slavery. I think it's a beautiful concept. I think it's a, an amazing answer. I think it's, it's novel. Uh, I, don't, I have not seen anyone else give such an answer. And, and it's a very, very important, important lesson for us. And that is, we have to understand that we live in a Western civilization, whether we live in Canada, in the U.S., and even in Eretz Israel, It's already a Western civilization. We have to remember where we come from. We have to remember who our patriarchs were, who our ancestors were, for, uh, were what they fought for. We can't so easily throw away our rituals, our traditions, our heritage, our Torah, our Minhagim. Just because we want to fit in. Just because we want to be like everyone else. 
the contrary. We are to be different. Because if we are not different, if we want to be like the Gentiles, guess what? God is going to remind us who we are through our enemies or through the Gentiles of the world. Anti-Semitism is a mechanism that God instilled in the world that as long as it's kind of counterintuitive. You think that if you act like a guy, they're going to embrace you and they're going to say, oh, come be like me. But on the contrary, all anti all all that anti-Semitism was instituted to do was to be there to take a Jew when the Jew's coming too close to trying to be like a Gentile to the Gentile to say, hey, you're not like me. Stay away. I always make the nose, many, oh, the, the nose, the joke, <laughs> that's the joke. I always make a joke that a Jew, there are some Jews who try to hide their Judaism. You know, they don't wear a kippah. Maybe, maybe they, 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 they dress a certain way, act a certain way. But between our accent to those of us who have accents or between our large noses, for those of us who have large noses, there's no way to hide our Judaism. A goy looks at you and they know you're Jewish. So stop hiding it. On the contrary, we see from this, this episode in, 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 in Egypt that when the Jewish people try to conceal their Judaism and they try to be like the Gentiles, that's when trouble comes. So we should fulfill our heritage, our traditions, our rituals with great pride and realize that even though it's counterintuitive, that is what prevents anti-Semitism and that is what prevents assimilation, which is the greatest battle we're battling today in the 21st century, more than ever before.